Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to this special episode of Left of Black. We are joined today by essayist and novelist and children's book author and screenplay writer, playwright, <laughs> Adam Mansback. Um, how are you doing today, Adam? I'm good. Thanks for having me. For those of you who aren't aware of Adam's work, which I can't imagine, uh, Adam's 2013 novel, Rage is Back, was named Best Book of the Year by NPR and the San Francisco Chronicle and is currently being adapted for the stage. His previous novels include the California Book Award winning The End of the Jews and the cult classic Angry Black White Boy taught at more than 80 institutions, including Duke University this semester. Mansback is also the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Go the Fuck to Sleep, which has been translated into 40 languages and Jamaican Patois, yes. and was Time Magazine's <laughs> 2011 Thing of the Year. The sequel, You Have to Fucking Eat, was published in November of 2014 and is also a New York Times bestseller. How are you doing, Adam? I'm good. I'm um, glad you mentioned the thing about Jamaican Pats. Well, <laughs> it's probably my proudest accomplishment. There's only two books that have been translated from so-called standard English into Jamaican Patois. One is the Bible, yeah. and the other is Go the Fuck, fuck to Sleep. sleep. <laughs> but only one has an audio book by Shaggy. So, proud of that. So let's talk, talk a little bit about your career. Um, you know, there's a way in which, if I'm telling, even undergraduate students, right? So we're, we're reading Angry Black White Boy this semester. Um, talk about that piece, talk about your other pieces of work. Um, the folks kind of like have this look and then you go, oh, go to fuck to sleep. And it's like, then everybody knows yeah. <laughs> who Adam Mansback is, right? Um, you know, what's it like trying to balance, you know, on the one hand, a book that's really about how celebrity circulates, mm -hmm. right? And another book and other books, you know, in particularly like Angry Black White Boy, you know, where you're bringing a kind of satirical view to conversations about race and ethnicity, yeah. um, that no matter how great the work is, is never going to circulate the same kind of way that a book like Go to Fuck to Sleep is. Yeah, I've, I've made peace with that fact. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because to me, if not to anybody else, I see a through line from books like Angry Black White Boy and The End of the Jews to Go to Fuck to Sleep in the sense that on some level they're all concerned with human complexity and mm -hmm. paradox. Uh, and that can be thorny and complicated. It can be about how you know, race and religious identity are weaponized and you know, the, the never ending sort of layers of humanity that we sift through and peel back to figure out who we are. Or it can be the very simple paradox of loving your kid to death, mm -hmm. but being willing to do anything to get out of that bedroom <laughs> after an hour and a half of trying to put him to sleep. You know, like if Don Corleone walked in the room and was like, I'll put the kid to sleep, but you may have to do me a service one day. You'd be like, whatever, Don Corleone, just take this baby. Um, you know, so I think all my work has been built on that notion of complexity and paradox and also the idea of trying to articulate uh, some, some truths that are difficult to speak or are forbidden to speak. Um, you know, as I was saying in your class earlier today, I wrote Angry Black White Boy to try to do what I could to jumpstart a stalled dialogue on race in the country. When you were 20 years old. Yeah, I was about that. Um, which, which is the kind of thing that you can only be as pompous, you know, to, I mean, even saying that shit now, I wanted to jumpstart a dialogue. I'm going to solve race. the race problem. I'm going right? to solve the race problem, yeah, with a novel. <laughs> um, but uh, what, I forget what the fuck I was talking about. Um, <laughs> What was I talking about? Talk about the human complexity. Oh, yeah, thank you. The human complexity. <laughs> right. I mean, but the reason that Go the Fuck to Sleep connected the way it did, from what I can tell, is it provided catharsis mm -hmm. and allowed parents to express something that was universally true, but forbidden to say because of the script they had to follow or felt they had to follow as parents and the things that were permissible to say and not say. Same, yeah. And like, those were the emails I got. Thousands of people were like, I could have written this book, you know? Therapists were telling me that they gave the book to their young parent clients to let them know that like the way they it's felt okay. was okay. It's okay to get it. You know, I got other emails too from people who were like, "I would never read this book to a child," 
That, which that, that's kind of not like the point. <laughs> it's not the point. Yeah, I'm still wondering about the blend of literacy and illiteracy that it would take to mistakenly read "Go the Fuck to Sleep" to a child. There's no documented cases so far of that actually happening, but I got a lot of those emails. So, so let me tell you my my introduction to uh, to Adam Mansback. Uh, this had to be probably about 15 years ago. Um, talking to Michael Eric Dyson, right? Or oh, had to be even before then, because you would have had to have been at Columbia still mm -hmm. at the time. So we're talking like 96, 97. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, yo, this is a white boy in my class. Adam Mansback, yo, that's a bad boy. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and going on and on, right? And, and then, of course, we, we kind of travel in the same circles, yeah. right? Um, Part of, of course, what, of what Michael was responding to was the idea that there was a young white guy, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old, um, who was adept enough to be able to navigate through, you know, the, all the potholes <laughs> of, of black culture uh, with a level of sophistication, uh, with a l level of literacy um, that you had to be taken seriously, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what was it like kind of navigating that? I mean, what you were doing, particularly in terms of the literary realm, I think about what Danny Hawk was doing, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of performance, right? Yeah. And, and there are folks like, folks who were fraught with all these conversations in response to Vanilla Ice, mm -hmm. uh, to some extent, the Beastie Boys, right? Mm -hmm. Though they kind of created their own lane around this. It's like, okay, wh what do we do with a Danny Hawk or an Adam Mansbach? I mean, what kind of pressures were you feeling, you know, as your voice was becoming more public, you were becoming more visible, mm -hmm. and was seen as someone who was credible to respond to, you know, whatever this thing hip hop was supposed to be? Yeah, um, it's funny. Danny and I are <clears throat> collaborating right now on the TV adaptation of Rage Is Back, my last novel, or trying to anyway. Um, you know, for, I mean, for me, that the project that you're talking about started very early. Um, I have this theory that there are, in hip hop, there's something that marks your, your age, which is not chronological. It has more to do with when you entered. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm 39 right now, but my, my hip hop age is probably more like 46 <laughs> because I started really young. Right. You know, I was like an 11 year old kid trying to rhyme and sneaking out at 13 to go to shows in Boston. And I have all these vague memories that are, are so kind of hazy and dreamy that I, I almost think they didn't happen because nobody else seems to remember them either. Like the 1990 Boston Rap Conference. <laughs> I've asked everybody I can think to who might have been there, who might have known about like, it. John about? Schechter, all kinds of people. I'm like, yo, B, do you remember the 1990 Rap Conference in Boston? Everybody's like, nah. I have an ID when card. When you were like 14. I was like 13, yeah. <laughs> Wearing a Malcolm X hat and t-shirt, you know. Um, be, and which, which, which goes right to the heart of the question, right? Because, you know, the thing that first politicized me was hip hop in a very real way. And I was in a household that was literate enough that I could chase down the relevant references, which were numerous and nonstop, yeah. without really leaving the house that much. Like, you know, when Chuck D shouted out Joanne Chesimard or Stokely Carmichael got invoked by KRS One, my father had those books on his shelf. He was a journalist. He was a progressive dude. He'd been in it and at it since the 60s. So I could hunt down at least some of that. Some of it took me to the library. Um, you know, but, but growing up in Boston, a, a deeply segregated city, um, but a city and a state, Massachusetts, that uh, considers itself very liberal and is right. constantly spraining its elbow, patting itself on the back for that. Um, I think I had an early sense of what the hypocrisy of white liberalism looked like. Because I was, you know, channeling in one ear the public enemies, the KRS ones, the X clans, the brand Nubians. I was exposed to that stuff in a deep way early, and took very seriously the project of trying to historicize it and also figure out where I fit into it, right? Um, and whether I fit into it, whether I had a right to exist in the hip hop space, which I thought that maybe I didn't. But next thing I knew, I'm like crashing on the couches of all these five percenters building in a cipher about the, the white devil, you know? And I was like, hmm. At some point, the political and the personal seem to have cleaved apart here because this dude just passed me a blunt, you know? And I've been here by my watch for some 38 hours now, you know? <laughs> like, so I mean, I, I was engaged in all of this stuff early and at, a, and at a time when to be a white kid in hip hop was completely anomalous. You were incredibly visible. And you had to understand your right to be in those spaces as very tenuous, 
something that could be revoked, and something that people around you had the right to question and that you had better have some answers for when they did question you. Not that the question was hostile, the question was curious, like what are you doing here? Literally, how did you get here? Why are you in Roxbury right now? Like, why are you wearing a Malcolm X hat? What do you know about him? What do you do? Because hip hop at that time was not fandom based, it was like participation, participation based. based. So right. if you were there, the assumption was that you did something. And I was, a, I was an MC. You were a journalist, you were an MC. You were, yeah, right. at the time I was an MC. Um, and you know. MC what? Oh man. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, my first MC name. Let me, let me, okay, this would be like, this would be like 80, 88, I guess. Um, and you, you, of course, recall the, the Public Enemy song that starts off, Too Black. Too Strong. Too yeah. Strong. Yeah. My friend Latif Bossman, I made him call himself Too Black, and I was Too, too Strong. strong. <laughs> okay. That was my first MC name. I went from that to Chief Justice. I called myself Chief Justice, okay. <laughs> which at the time was like kind of fresh. Like I'm not that embarrassed of that name, actually. Um, and there was a whole succession of others, um, including, you can kind of track the, the flow of time through these names. Uh, I was Flipside Nefarious for a little while. Um, <laughs> uh, I was Kodiak Brinks for a long time. Okay. Um, but at that time, like being approached by somebody and asked what you're doing there and what you do was, was an opening, you know? And um, like many of the sort of anomalous white kids who occupied hip hop back in, the, in those days, I was really looking for affirmation. I was looking to semantically separate myself from the kind of nimbus of, of privilege and obliviousness and all these objectionable things that I had come to associate with whiteness, which was not a community-based project and it wasn't a particularly fruitful project in any way. It was about like feeling better about yourself. I think nowadays white kids do the same thing simply on consumer right. identification. It's right. like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm on the right side of the struggle because I bought like a, like, a, like a most deaf CD or whatever the fuck, you know? Back then, you at least had a little skin in the game because you were physically in a space. Nice, yeah. But my answer, among others, was like, I rhyme, I'm an MC. Oh, word, let me hear you spit something. And I was good. And I was especially good because the only markers of white MCing were the Beastie Boys who were not good, you know? <laughs> Like, this was a pre-vanilla ice world. You're you just going to say that, right? You're just yeah, going to put I mean, that shit out there. Look, the Beastie Boys are, are, are good at many things, but rhyming is not really among them, you know? Like, I respect their efforts for Tibetan freedom. <laughs> their magazine was cool when it existed, but like, circa 1986, 87, I did not want to be associated with the Beastie, Beastie Boys. Boys because of the rhyme skills, but also people forget how obnoxious they were. Yeah, right. They had a way, and you know, in retrospect, it's easier for me to understand that they were so deeply a part of New York culture yeah. that they felt entitled to do the shit that they did. But like for me, from some remove, I just thought that they were clowning hip hop culture as they clown themselves. You know, and it was, it was just yeah, distasteful. I didn't want to be like them. I didn't want to rhyme yeah. like them. And they were spraying beer at people on stage, and they had like a giant inflatable phallus on stage. Like they were not my model of you know right. what hip hop was supposed to be. But when I did rhyme. I immediately got more credit than I deserve because the standards and the you know were so low, low for, for like white right. MCs, you know. Right. Um, so then suddenly, and I think to me that's like a metaphor for the way that white people are received in black culture. Like if you're a little bit respectful and a little bit talented, you're received with arms that are open far wider than they probably should be. Robin Thicke. Right, before he decided yeah. to counter suit. <laughs> right, right. I never wore a suit with that many pinstripes on it. But yeah, exactly. I mean, the standards are so low. The typical relationship between a white performer or aficionado or whatever is so exploitive. And there's such a history of that that if you come more or less correct with some semblance of knowledge, history, right. you move with a certain kind of respect, like you're embraced yeah. immediately. And that's. Yeah in a way, a sad thing. I mean, because of what it speaks to, yeah. you know? We were at a historic gathering um, at Stanford oh, about man. 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. um, historic, particularly in the sense that just so many people were in the room. Yeah. Uh, one of which, of course, was Karis Wan. Yes. Um, who Last had semester. maybe one of his most infamous meltdowns, yeah. uh, accuses Adisa Van Jaco of, of being an FBI yes, informant, right? Yes. This is all going on around a round table. You were moderating um, that round table. I tried to moderate it. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. 
Um, but I do remember a comment that you made there um, that I'd like for you to kind of expound upon. You were talking about, you know, the fact that really since the Harlem, you know, the Harlem Renaissance writers and critics, you know, made an investment in the idea that if they showed white America black humanity mm -hmm. and black greatness and arts, right, it would fundamentally shift how white folks thought about black folks, mm -hmm. right? We see that project go through the civil rights movement, right? And, and Elvis, right? The Elvis moment is about mm -hmm. some of that. So there is this perception that if you have young white backpackers mm -hmm. who are growing up listening to hip hop, that naturally when they become adults, their politics will follow suit. Right. And you actually made a, you know, you push back against that and say, you know, actually it might go the other way around, right? It might actually produce white cats that might be even a little bit more conservative mm -hmm. than they would have been otherwise. Um, you know, do you think that, you know, yourself notwithstanding, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that kids who are consuming hip hop the way they are 10 years ago, or even now, mm -hmm. do you think it actually has any real impact on, you know, their political views, you know, vis-a-vis -vis whether or not they're looking more progressive or, or less? First of all, I'm immensely flattered that you remember anything that I had to say on the day that KRS-One <laughs> lost his fucking mind. Uh, that was a crazy day. Um, it was a long, crazy, a long, crazy, crazy day. day. Yeah, yeah. I just remember him, his rant was, delivered while standing up. Right. And the microphone he was holding was one of those ones with the super heavy 15 pound bass. And he was holding it the whole, I was like, this dude, his arm was kind of shaking. Like, Busy B was shouting out random shit. And I remember among other things, he was like, no one here is from the Bronx. And you and Joan Morgan were like, hey, you're not from the Bronx. Davey, Davey's like, uh, I was yeah. from the Bronx. And Chris is from Park Slope, anyway. Um, so we should do like a whole documentary yeah, on that <laughs> day because everybody remembers it vividly and there were so many perspectives on it. It was so crazy and it was so sad because this guy, everybody in the room had been inspired by him That's and right. these were the people best positioned to right. let him come to campuses and do his thing. Like everybody there was a fan and a, an official, you know, it was just, it was just alienated, sad. He alienated the shit out of everybody. <laughs> anyway, I, no, the answer is by virtue of listening to hip hop, white kids are not going to necessarily become or stay more progressive, you know, any more than the Woodstock generation, right. you know, who was, they were grooving a Sly and Jimi Hendrix and, you know, the, the interracial stylings of Big Brother and the Holding Company or whatever. It didn't stop them from voting in their own perceived self-interest. It didn't stop them from becoming, you know, Reagan Democrats or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that with hip hop, you run the, the risk, I mean, you run the risk of white kids thinking that they actually understand something substantively about black life, black suffering, through this very mediated uh, matrix of hip hop, and, pro and, and furthermore, proclaiming themselves gatekeepers mm -hmm. of the culture, mm -hmm. experts. I mean, that move happened very fast. The moment that I always think about in terms of that comes in the early 90s. Um, 91, 92, 93, on college campuses around the country because there's this, this sort of, the Venn diagram of what is being listened to on college campuses in everybody's dorm room and what is sort of hot in the streets, the, the central piece in that Venn diagram begins to grow. So there's like, which, which in effect means that there's a generation of white kids who got into hip hop at that time in their freshman, sophomore year of college, and the first records they bought were De La Soul, Tribe Called Quest, right. Souls of Mischief, maybe even a brand Nubian record or a KRS-One record, and they were rewarded in their taste because like, you know, their, their, their neighbor down the hall who was from Brooklyn liked those same records, or their neighbor down the hall who was from Compton was also a fan. So they began to feel that their taste was impeccable and that they were instant experts. And they became like the kind of takeover generation uh, who went into the music business, became A&Rs, became magazine writers, became journalists, became tastemakers, became gatekeepers. And they're sort of the pre-backpack generation. And then you get the self-righteousness of the backpack generation. Yeah. Um, and I say generation loosely. I mean, we're talking about two, three, four year periods of time. Um, 
I don't know that hip hop in 2015 necessarily radicalizes anybody or even contributes substantively to anybody's understanding of race unless they are digging very deep in the crates for underground music and political music. Um, we can't really get the horse back in the barn. Like <laughs> hip hop has left the building in terms of that kind of engagement in the mainstream. So you know, you could listen to hip hop all day and night and be a white kid from Arkansas who never met a black person. And you probably wouldn't learn much, you know? It's not, you're not going to the library to look up Joanna Chesimard. You're like maybe learning about some luxury brands you didn't know about before. Um, so yeah, I'm not as optimistic as I once was, certainly. I mean, you know, we, we thought hip hop, like I thought that in 2015, KRS-One would be able to move objects with his mind, you know? I thought Chuck D would be like the governor of New York or a senator or something. And I don't want to act like disillusioned, like hip hop failed us. Hip hop has fundamentally transformed the world. It's transformed the academy. It's transformed Absolutely. every art form there is, you know, from theater right. to novel writing uh, to, to... It's transformed how we think about producing wealth. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's transformed all those things, but in terms of the kind of like straight up political change that we kind of hoped would happen in that little window of time, you know, that's not one of the things that has happened. The primary character in your book, Angry Black White Boy, uh, Macon Deternay, right? Could he have imagined Ryan Lewis and Macklemore? Interesting. Um, Yes, I think he could have in a kind of nightmare scenario for him. <laughs> you know, because first of all, they would be white boys who were potentially cooler than him. And Macon, certainly in the book, suffers from the pathology that I was referring to earlier, where Jeff Chang, I think, calls it white on white crime. And it's this <laughs> phenomenon of the singularity of wanting to be the only cool white boy, the right. downest white boy. So, you know, if there's another white kid who came in the party back in those days, you're like, who the fuck is that? Because either he was going to embarrass you by being lame and thus bringing down the white race, you know, <laughs> or he was going to, even worse, be cooler than you and <laughs> take your crown. Um, so I think Macon, although he certainly um, subscribes to the kind of theory that hip hop represents the ultimate in blackness and is the kind of kid for whom. Uh, who, who makes himself an arbiter of authentic blackness, even though he's white, and judges people not black enough if they don't hate white people. His typical friend is somebody who is black, hates white people, and loves him. You know what I mean? He wants to win that dude over, over, and over, and over again. If you walk in the room and you're like not hostile toward white people or whiteness, right. then he can't really fuck with you, because like, he's like, well, what are your politics? Right. Right. He almost encourages the the negativity drawn towards him first is some sort of right. like, you know, yeah. litmus test, right? Right, because he wants right. to put himself on stage and defeat that assumption over and over and be told over and over again that he's like the downest white boy right. on the planet. And that's a, you know, ultimately pointless endeavor, but I think he'd be able to imagine a Macklemore um, in a kind of distant, deracialized world that looks more like jazz, you know? I mean, like, I used to be a roadie for, for the Elvin Jones, the greatest drummer on the planet. Uh, no longer on the planet, but right. history of the planet. Right. Elvin, right. Elvin was John Coltrane's drummer, right. as you know, right. in the 60s. Right. And I traveled with him for about six years, and the cats in that band had a joke, which was, what do you call a black man in a jazz club? And the answer was, a musician. Because we played for white and Japanese audiences everywhere we went. Right. You know, um, and I think maybe Macon could, in a kind of fever dream, imagine hip hop going in that direction, going in a place. I think it would be easier for him to imagine a Macklemore who's, you know, successful, but his skills are kind of contested, right? More so than he might be able to imagine an Eminem who changed the conversation by eliminating the question of whether a white MC could be dope, yeah. and then opening up other avenues that kind of lay beyond that one. Let's talk about Macklemore for a second. Um, this song, um, Downtown, you know, which features Melly Mel, Kumo D, Grandmaster Kaz. I mean, the yeah. Kaz piece is kind of important, right? Because yeah. 
you know, even folks deep heads, you know, Kaz never translated to that visual moment right. that folks would have known Akumo cool D in a music yeah. video or, or Kaz never even not. really recorded, recorded a, right. a, a, um, a reasonable so, so you give him some credit for, you know, knowing the culture in that regard. Um, and yet it's like the only people that really would want to listen to Kaz mm -hmm. <laughs> and Melly Mel and Kumo cool D in, two, in 2015 are folks who don't know who the fuck they are. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I mean, who, who are, are consuming the idea yeah. that Macklemore is introducing to them these pioneers, right? And that's their interest in it. Right. Um, so Macklemore becomes this curator. Yes, right. Um, and, and it's odd because on the one hand, you know, Drake would never do that. Right. You know, Jay-Z would never do that, right? right. So you almost want to give Macklemore some props for creating some sort of monetary stream, yeah, you know, for these rappers, you know, who who aren't going to get endowed chairs at Duke or mm -hmm. Cornell or someplace like that, like filmmakers do, yeah, <laughs> like in poets and stuff like that, um, you know, what kind of, you know, it's conflicted, right? Because mm -hmm. on the one hand, it's like the music itself, yeah, it's some bullshit, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's. You know, the video, I, I watched the video, I'm like, what the fuck really is this, yeah. right? And then it sounds like, you know, who's the light-skinned little short guy? Yeah. Uh, Uptown Funk? Bruno Mars. Bruno Mars. Oh. Like, it's like a dead rip-off of Bruno Mars. Right. Everything from the video to the sound, right? right? So, you know, it'll be a number one pop hit. Um, so, you, you, on the one hand, you want to give them kudos mm -hmm. for creating this screen for these, you know, these original cats. Yeah. But, you know, is that really hip hop? Yeah, it's it's a tricky one. That's a tricky one to unpack. Um, I mean, let's start with the the pros, right? Like the pros are, as you said, nobody else is putting those guys on, right. and those guys are the undisputed heavyweight champs of the right. old school. Like right. those right. three, nobody would argue that those guys comprise a trinity of of, of old school right. rappers. Mo D in his day was probably further ahead of the field than any rapper before Absolutely. since, I would argue. Absolutely. Like, Mo D in the early 80s is like Louis Armstrong in the early 20s. He's running circles around. Right. He picked up the pace. Or yeah, the double time, yep. killing it. Kaz is the inspiration for everybody. Nobody of the second generation, from Kane to G-Rap to you know KRS to whoever, like Kaz changed the game and never got credit for it. So on one hand, he's choosing the right guys. Right. He's putting money in their pockets. On the other hand, there, it does kind of leave a bad taste somehow because it feels like this curation. It, feels, it, it, it signals the power that he has in a way that is discomforting. Mm -hmm. And he didn't really put them to their best advantage, right? It would be one thing if we were sitting here like, yo, did you hear Kaz's verse? He fucking kills it. Right. But we're not really saying that. No, no, not um, at all. But I mean, there's a sincerity and an earnestness to it that I, that I like and also don't like. Yeah. You know, it's a lot more sincere than Jay, -Z, than Jay Z saying that he's overcharging for what they did to the cold crush. And the cold crush don't see none of You're like, wait, right. overcharging who, how, and how, who, how does that benefit the, the cold, cold crush? crush like, what are you point, talking right, about? Right, right. I mean, of course, Jay Z has a history of these disingenuous. Uh, sort of fake altruistic moments or excuses. You know, this is the same guy who's like, you know, I want to rap like uh, common sense, but I sold five mil, I ain't been common sense. He said that on what was supposed to be his last album. It's like, you got a critique you want to make, like now would be the time. You own the record label, you know, you want to shout out these guys and then discuss why your lyrics don't contain the depth that theirs right. do. Then again, common probably hasn't done anything good since then. So I don't know, maybe Jay-Z cursed him. I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to say. Hard to say. Um, the other thing about Macklemore, though, is that by all accounts, he's a longtime member in very good standing of the Seattle hip-hop scene that he right. came out of. Um, I haven't heard anybody from Seattle diss him or say he's a Johnny-come-lately. Right. Um, he may be a dude who kind of is what he appears to be, which is deeply sincere, well-schooled in the music, and corny. And those guys exist, you know? And there are a lot worse guys out there than well, that. Well, hell, know? that's Will Smith, right? Yeah. Right, that's, that's who Will Smith was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's 2015. We're now in year seven of the Obama presidency. Mm. Um, is this what you expected? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> you know, I think... This is going to sound possibly stupid or naive. 
Um, but it's a question of magnitude. I don't think anybody, okay, on one hand, I think we all expected tremendous racist blowback to the election of the first black president. On the other hand, I don't think any of us understood, let me just speak for myself, I don't think I understood just how tremendous that blowback would be, how all encompassing, and how it was going to swallow seven years of policy making. Yeah. I mean, like, the, the, the degree of difficulty that Obama has faced in his presidency cannot be overstated. Yeah. I mean, the hostility of the opposition party, who, who from day one have run on a platform of trying to fuck him up. Yeah. You know, like nothing else. Like your man John Boehner, you know, the dearly departed <laughs> orange John Boehner, like came in and was like, our agenda for the next four years is to make sure that Obama fails in everything he attempts to do. Yeah. That's unprecedented. Right. So is the kind of disrespect that he's faced, you know, semantically, visually, politically, in every regard. No other, like George Bush lied and took us to war. Nobody was talking, standing up in, in joint sessions of Congress yelling, you lied at George Bush, as Obama was facing right. from day one. Right. You know, getting loud talked on the tarmac by soon to be ex-governors. Like, this shit is crazy. <laughs> like, that level of disrespect is insane. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I, I mean, you know, I, when, when, when he gave the speech on race in Philadelphia, I, listened very hard, and I wrote a piece about it for Tracy Sharpley Whiting's book mm -hmm. called The Speech. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the beginning of, I mean, I was, a, I was a big Obama fan, a big supporter. I wrote a political ad for him in 2012 called Wake the Fuck Up that Sam Jackson starred in. Right. So I mean, I've, right. I've been a fan. I continue to be a supporter. I think he's having an amazing fourth quarter. Yeah. Um, he's going to finish super strong. And you know, again, to, to, to just quote kind of another truism, like his administration's failure to communicate their accomplishments is profound and we would all, the country would prob probably should understand them better than they do because they just haven't done a good job of communicating the victories and right. the successes. Um, but when I, when I saw that speech and he did the politically necessary thing, which was to equate white animosity and white sort of anger with institutional racism. He put those two things on an equal footing, kind of morally and historically. I was like, okay, I see, you know. We're not, we're gonna get a lot of that shit. Yeah. You know, we're gonna get a guy who is gonna parse and tread very lightly around these issues. We're not gonna get the guy who's gonna come in and lead a national conversation on race. And right. frankly, the president probably shouldn't be that guy. Right. Um, that said, I think that it's quite likely that this is the most progressive president of my lifetime. Right. I mean, my lifetime to date and going forward. I mean, that's pretty astounding, actually, to yeah. consider. Yeah. Given the critiques of his presidency for both the left and the right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, you know, it's it's hard to imagine an environment that would. Well, it's not that hard. I mean, it's very easy right now to imagine an environment where Donald Trump continues to pillage and burn everything in his path, somehow secures the nomination. <laughs> You could run Bernie Sanders against him and he would probably win. I don't think he'd be able to get anything done once he got in office. But I mean, the way that the right is imploding and toggling further and further right, I suppose would open the space for a truly progressive president. Yeah. But I don't see it happening. <laughs> it's funny, Saul Williams, um, who has a new book, uh, you know, he's been quoted as saying, you know, part of what's wrong with you know, American, the American educational system and pop culture in general is that we're all now apprentices in, in Donald Trump's show, mm. <laughs> right? That, that's what we're vying for, right? To have that kind of level of visibility. Um, I compare that to our friend Rosa Clemente, you mm -hmm. know, who of course was a 2008 uh, Green Party vice mm -hmm. presidential candidate. And in her read of Obama, she says part of the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, actually comes from this severe disappointment, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that, that the, the literal crashing of hope yeah. that that generation that voted for Obama in 2008 has experienced over this last seven years, yeah. that without this kind of level of hope being dashed, that you would not have had the kind of growth of a political voice that you see in you know, Black Lives Matter. Yeah. So it's an interesting irony, right? You yeah. know, that you have a president who you know, might be read as the most progressive president this country has ever seen to some extent. Yeah. Um, 
who many on the left see as a failure, you mm -hmm. know, as a certain kind of failed presidency, but in the seeds of his presidency, right, is this new generational voice that's politicized, yeah. you know, around obviously the murder of black bodies and, and a range of other issues. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you know, it's partly the constraints of the, like the, in a, in a, in a, in a better world, uh, there'd be a counterweight to the right-wing critique of Obama and the right-wing critique in general that would be just as strident and just as loud coming from the left, and this would, you know, do its part to push mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. left. You know, I mean, like, I'm, I'm not articulating this very well, but like, you know, the, the, the right-wing craziness creates these very tight parameters around the dialogue and makes invisible any critique from the left. So everybody just ends up moving rightward and it's as if there isn't a critique from the left that um, has any political weight behind it that can move Obama in that direction. Right. And in part know? because the left has been rendered invisible yeah. by mainstream media, right? So yeah. It's as if there's like a left doesn't exist in this country. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I, I, I know you're interested in what we're watching on our televisions these days, um, <laughs> if only related to your own projects. Right. Um, how do you explain Empire? How do you explain this show about the creation of black wealth mm -hmm. in which Academy Award nominated actors and actresses <laughs> play the most cartoonish characters you could imagine, but yet in all of this are conversations about you know, black corporations going public, mm. <laughs> right? The, the opening episode for the second season, which is about as much of Black Lives Matter that we're gonna get in any mainstream television, mm -hmm. right, you know, for the next five years, mm -hmm. right, where Free Lucius becomes this reference to Free Huey for a generation who have no idea who Huey is. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you explain a phenomenon like that? You know, you know, if someone would have told me that someone's making a tell that Lee Daniels, right, mm -hmm. and his crazy ass, right? Yeah. Lee Daniels is making, I hope he don't sue me <laughs> <laughs> right, for defamation, right? <laughs> that Lee Daniels and his crazy ass was gonna make a yeah. television show about uh, Terrence Howard as a hip hop mogul. Right with a conch, at right. least, you know, for the first three episodes. Right. And that would be the most watched drama in America. I, I would have been like, you're fucking crazy. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Um, I mean, how do you explain it? Right. I cannot explain it. I mean, except to say that it fits very comfortably in a tradition of melodrama and soap operas. Um, you know, it's, it's like it's the new Dallas. You so know? it's just the black Dallas has turned? <laughs> I think that's a big part of it. Um, but you know, I'm gonna be honest. I'm I'm not watching Empire, <laughs> so like, because I really only have so much time, and particularly time alone to view shit. So like, I will watch it at some point, if only because all my friends are watching it, and if if only because the next time somebody asks me that question, I should have something to say. Um, but like, that will be the only reason that I will watch it is so that I can have conversations about it. I don't see myself enjoying it because. Frankly, I don't enjoy anything on network television ever. Like I don't, there's nothing I watch uh, or feel good about watching anyway <laughs> on network television. Like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, an HBO kind of dude, you know? Um, I mean, there's probably plenty to say about it, but I happen to not be the guy to say it, you know? <laughs> what about Straight Outta Compton? We can talk about Straight Outta Compton, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I mentioned that Danny Hawk and I are trying to adapt my book, Rage is Back, for TV right now. And the, the, the time to strike is now, which is ridiculous, right? Rage is Back is a novel about a group of kind of retired, disenfranchised, disgruntled graffiti writers from the train era, 70s and 80s New York City, who have been forced into retirement. It's about them reuniting in 2005 to paint all the trains in the New York City transit system in one weekend in order to bring down a former Vandal Squad cop who's now running for mayor and may or may not be aligned with a demon who may or may not be living in the tunnels beneath the city. <laughs> it's like your basic magic realist graffiti revenge right. story. What does that have to do with empire 
or straight out of Compton? Nothing. But to TV executives, it has hip hop written on it, as does Empire, as does Straight Outta Compton, and suddenly like they want to meet with us, they want to develop it with us, they want to like yeah. be the ones to come and pitch it. So the label of hip hop is still being bandied about by people in that industry who don't understand it in the most kind of cynical and crass way. Um, but we're gonna have, there's a moment right now between those two projects and the success of Hamilton on Broadway. It's funny, the irony is that in exactly the way that the album Straight Outta Compton changed the music industry and ushered in an era where every gangster group got signed to a major record label despite... Whether that they were good or not. Yeah, whether they were good or not. Right. Straight Outta Compton, the movie, is gonna have the same effect any kind of hip hop story is gonna have its day in court, whether it's any good or not. It's interesting. Um, I thought Straight Outta Compton, I mean, first of all, I should say I'm not a huge fan generally of biopics because they do, they, they tend to spend so much time winking at the audience and being like, this is a historical moment, you know? <laughs> like there's just so much of that, no matter what movie it is, and Straight Outta Compton does it all the time. Like, What's your new label called? And Dre like stops and like looks at the camera and is like, <laughs> aftermath, you know? And it's like, dun, 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 you know? And it's like, come on. Like, and that happens like multiple times in the movie and I, I can't stand that shit. Um, there's a lot of nerdy, historically inaccurate stuff that bothers me as somebody who remembers that stuff very well. Like, you know, Straight Outta Compton wasn't their first album. You know, the World Class Wrecking Crew doesn't really exist. The DOC goes from a hanger on to a, a victim without ever releasing his classic album in the movie. In the movie. Yeah. Um, you know, things like that. Um, the thing that irks me the most, though, I think, is that the process of creation um, gets obliterated. And this happens usually in movies about artists because it's very hard to dramatize what creation looks like, and it's not sexy, right. and it's not something you can fruitfully point a camera at. So, but in Straight Outta Compton, what happens again and again is that every time a song is created or an important moment happens, it's as if it happens without any forethought. The artists create without any process. I mean, you see Ice Cube writing on a pad on a bus early in the movie. Beyond that, every time something gets created, it's like off the cuff, spur of the moment. Dr. Dre is sitting in his house, noodling on a keyboard, and just as Snoop walks down the stairs, also Snoop is like 5'8 in this movie. That's a problem also, but like Snoop just happens to walk down the staircase as he happens upon the nothing but a G thing keyboard line and is like, yeah, man. And he, and he just starts freestyling his exact verse from G thing, including like Dre's half bar insertion, as if that's how songs get created. And of course, like people experiment, people freestyle, but like right. that's just fundamentally, it's inaccurate. It, it, it irks me for the same reason that it irked me when, you know, Jack Kerouac spent his life pretending he wrote on the road in one amphetamine fuel 12-hour oh, right, right. binge on a roll of butcher paper. And it's like, dude, you wrote 10 drafts. We have them. Like, <laughs> stop, stop obliterating process. Like, artists, this shit is a discipline. And it doesn't really help us to pretend that everybody just, like, freestyles their album. You know, a select few do that, but most people put in work, and they revise, and they edit. And, you know, I know I have students who don't want to edit, and that's part of the reason why, you know? Um, so I have a problem a little bit with that. Um, you know, of course, the fact that there are no women in the movie who are not prostitutes, mothers, or wives nice. is problematic. Also, the fact that the people who are wives appear for the first time as wives. It's like, yo, like... When did you get married? When did you get married? The last time we saw you with a woman, you were in a hotel room with a bunch of naked people, and now you're married? Like, what? What, do you, what the fuck is this? You know, so that, that's weird. There's a lot of weird things. Um, I think the first half of the movie is a lot better than the second half. Yeah. Um, I don't, I think that they, they could have also done a better job of communicating NWA's place in the, in the sort of constellation of hip hop and the way in which they made an impact on the world. Um, that didn't quite crystallize for me, but that might just be me. Um, I don't know, it brought back a lot of memories and I'm, it's also just a surreal experience to like be sitting in a movie theater eating popcorn in 2015 and watching this group that you remember, you know, getting a, like a bootleg cassette of and like, you know, listening to at the low volume in the right. basement so your parents exactly. didn't hear it and now it's setting records for opening weekend for an R-rated movie. Like, 
that's obviously a surreal sitting experience. Sitting in the theater and everybody singing the songs, yeah. you know, along with you, right? <laughs> so, you know, our man James Braxton Peterson has this great book that's coming out next year on hip hop. Um, and one of the chapters, you know, because of his, his foot in the kind of educational thing, he talks about playlist pedagogy, mm -hmm. right? This idea of us teaching through playlist, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I'm going to ask you to put together a playlist okay. right now. Um, and, and it's going to be in your lane, okay. right? Because, <laughs> you know, we, we could have this conversation about, you know, black satire, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so if you had to put together a playlist of, of the five most important works of black satire, of black satire. Um, okay. and they don't just have to be books. I mean, they could be yeah. other forms of media that you would put in that mix. Okay. All right. This is going to be a very subjective list, obviously. Of course. It's, it's Things your that list. I personally care about. Um, the, the easiest thing for me to put on that list would be Paul Beatty's book, The White Boy Shuffle, um, because it was just incredibly seminal for me when it came out in 96. Um, it kind of taught me what a satire could do. Mm -hmm. I never would have written Angry Black White Boy without it. Or actually, I'd written a, a very early, super earnest, like courtroom drama screenplay version of Angry Black White Boy that was fucking terrible. <laughs> and reading The White Boy Shuffle made me realize the direction I could take it in and make it work. Yeah. Um, and that was the first book that I remember Katz consuming with the fervor of a new album. Like walking around my college, all right, it was just really my man Vernon, but like he, <laughs> I remember him just walking around the campus like, like, like this, like, like, you know, like reading just crazy, right. you know. Um, that was hugely important for me. Um, I, gotta, I think I got to put the Chappelle show on there. Yeah. You know, the Chappelle show at its best, in, a, in an otherwise like bleak and kind of empty field, held, held down a certain yeah. spot. You know, like I think everybody talks about it and talks about, you know, the abrupt ending and this and that. And like not everything on the Chappelle show was good. Like right. there was a lot of shit that was not good. I mean, there's a way that it was not sustainable. I mean, just, yeah. just quite honest. I mean, it might have been a third season, maybe a fourth, but yeah. what we see kind of midway through that first season yeah. and into the second season, you, you can't sustain that. Like. Yeah, but, but at its best, it was, it was brilliant and transcendent. And also, I think on a kind of historically, like looking back on it, it was the only thing at the time. Yeah. Like there was nothing right. else in the category of like satire, in the category of edgy television. I can't think of, or, 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 or music or any, like I, don't, I can't remember anything else. Um, all right. Uh, I'm gonna put the uh, I'm gonna put the, the 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 one and a half minute opening song on the first Black Sheep album on the list. You remember this song? I don't. <laughs> it's um it's the best gangster parody in the history of hip hop. It's over a, a really fast bar case sample, and it's Drez from Black Sheep, who's one of my favorite MCs right. and one of the most underrated, because at his peak he was right. he was the dude. I think there's different ways to judge MCs. There's longevity and, and, and all kinds of things, but there's also like how dominant were you at your peak, no matter how short your peak was, and Drez circa that album was right, killing right, shit. Right. The, whole, the whole song is this frenetic gangster parody where he like gets out of bed and like, punch, you know, he's just, he's just wiling out killing people at random, and it's hilarious, and, and then it turns out that it's a dream at the end. <laughs> You know, he's like, he's like, the mailman came, so I cut his motherfucking throat. Ah, waiting for the motherfucking school bus. Ah, ah. And then it's like, yo, Drez, yo, Drez, wake up, man, wake up. I dreamed that I was hard, hard, hard. Like, that's, it's, it's brilliant. He, you know, he's, yeah. I think that was, that was a brilliant bit of satire. And like, hip hop is a lot of things, but it's actually not that often satirical. Right. You know? It's pretty earnest. It pretty much wears its heart to sleep a lot De of times. Soul's Ghost Weed. Ghost Weed is good. Well, you know, the, the, the Me, Myself, and I video yeah, is a good, right. a good piece, piece of, of hip-hop yeah. satire. I think yeah. visually it gets communicated, but lyrically, there's mostly a lot of, a lot of very earnest yeah. stuff. At least, you know. And the shit that's satirical is usually not good. Because it's usually like somebody's way of, of hedging their bets. Right. You know? Right. 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 I mean, there are exceptions. I think Master Ace has done some, some good satirical stuff. All right, what else? Um, I like Black No More a lot. Mm -hmm. um, George Schuyler. George Schuyler. Um, I like him a lot because he was just, he was like one of these like, when in Rome, do as the Egyptians type dudes. He was just, 
He didn't give a fuck. He was like, if you I, like me, fuck you. If you I, I don't like me, fuck you. I can't help but think that Fard Muhammad, you know, the father mm -hmm. of the Nation of Islam, yeah. read that novel. Right. Yeah. And out of that novel, he came the germ of yeah. Yakub. Yeah. <laughs> right. The scientist who creates the yeah. perhaps the white devil. I Absolutely. Mean, I mean, when you put it in a historical context, oh yeah, that should actually make some sense. Yeah. No, the timing lines up, right? right. Black Noir is what, like 23 or something? 32, 32, 32. Right. And nation, you know, Fard no, shows up 34, 35. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. 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 No, I think I think we were talking earlier about how some satire does not age well. Um, but that one really does. Yeah. And that's that's a testament. I mean, cause satire has to be so specific, yeah. you know? And I mean, there are plenty of people that he lampoons in that story who you probably have to explain what he's doing to your students, right? right. You have to be like, well, that's Booker. You right, because it's 1932, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the fact that we can still read that book today and not necessarily know who he's going at, but still find it yeah. funny and still find it biting is amazing. I'm tempted to say, I'm tempted to put Invisible Man on the list that's interesting. The only reason I wouldn't is because I, I'm not entirely sure that I'd call it a satire. satire. Then again, like Paul Beatty won't call the white boy shuffle a satire, so everybody has their own rules, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think there are certainly satirical elements and absurdist elements in Invisible Man. All them damn light bulbs. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. who the fuck does that, right? Yeah. So I mean, potentially that. Um, I don't. You know, I'm 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 sort of tempted to to put some comedy on there, but comedy. I mean, like stand-up comedy doesn't usually go in a satirical direction. I mean, it's it's like something else. It's right. its own beast. Yeah. So I can't really say Richard Pryor, you know, um, unless we talk about like a skit or something. Yeah. Um, so I think that's fine. <laughs> what you listening to these days? Um, as far as new stuff. Yeah. I'm, I, I like the Prime album a lot, the uh, Premier and Royce and Adrian Young record. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. And it's also an interesting direction because, you know, in this sort of post-sampling era, I think you're going to see more and more of what they do, which is Adrian Young is a, is a musician. Right. He gave Primo his library, and he's like, chop it up, do what you want with it. Right. So Primo has a, a sampling, you know, source that he can draw from. And people, from. Have been, people have been sleeping, you know, on Adrian Young. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's like... Even two years later, it's like, oh, that's the dude that did the Jay Z, right, right, Picasso right. baby. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when I heard that song, my first thought was, I can't wait to see who's gonna freestyle over that beat. Yeah, because this yeah. song is garbage, but that beat is hot. <laughs> um, I really, my favorite new MC of probably the last five years or more is this kid called Your Old Droog, who is uh, he caused some controversy the summer before this one. He came out out of nowhere, dropped a mixtape, and everybody thought it was Nas. <laughs> because he, he has a raspy voice. His, the timbre of his voice is a little bit similar to Nas. Yeah. And if you don't listen very carefully, yeah. you know, if, if you're not somebody who really takes in lyrics and parses them, I guess I could sort of see it. People had all kinds of theories. Droog is Russian for friend. People were like, yo, it's Nas. He's your old friend, and da-da-da-da. <laughs> um, your old Droog is not Nas. Your old Droog is a 25-year-old Ukrainian uh, Brooklyn kid. He's from Coney Island, the Coney Island right, Projects. Right. Um, and he's dope. He's just, he's just lyrically incredible. Like, he's the, funniest, he's the funniest writer and the cleverest writer in the game right now, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, I've had a little bit of contact with him. I was, he, he shouts out um, my friend Sasha Jenkins on the uh -huh. record, who uh -huh. used to run Ego Trip right, and just right, did this right. documentary on hip hop fashion. Right. Sasha's a great dude, knows everybody. So I called Sasha like, yo, who is this guy? And the next thing I know, I get an email from Droog. He's like, yo, I heard you're one of the few who gets it. You know, let's break bread. Like, <laughs> let's go to one of these Jewish delis in the city. You know, I spent the last five years pretending I'm Puerto Rican. I want to get culture. And I was like, yo, this shit is hilarious. Um, and then the day that we were supposed to go, he emails me, he's like, yo, I can't go, B, I gotta help my mom do laundry. <laughs> I was like, I love this guy, you know? So I still haven't met him, but I mean, he's just really witty, really clever. You know, he says shit like, you're just a parasite like the Eiffel. Okay. Yeah. His extended metaphor game is crazy. Um, he's, he's just dope, and he's just a pure, thoroughbred MC. Um, and he's a perfect example of the thing I was trying to talk about earlier, where the chronological age and the hip-hop age right, are different things. Right. His are probably 
more divergent than anybody I can think of offhand. He's 25, but his, his frame of reference is like a dude who's 50. Right. Who's 50. Yeah. yeah, like like it's crazy. I mean, it's like he's got a, a, a super thorough working knowledge of hip hop from 1990 as if he was there and remembers it. And he wasn't even born. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, and of course, that whole 90s nostalgia movement is a thing that's happening right now. You got guys like Joey Badass and right. all these kids who want to get 90s beats and work right. with 90s producers. But Droog encompasses it in a way that feels totally organic mm -hmm. and just makes you look at him like this dude is just a student of everything. I like him a lot. I like, I like this kid Ka from Brownsville who is, is a veteran. I mean, has been around forever. Rhymes over beats that are super duper minimal and like, you know, dark and grim and like barely have drums in them sometimes. Um, he'll never sell a single record, but he's lyrically amazing. Yeah. Um, he was in a 90s group. One of those groups, you know, like there were all those New York underground 90s groups with like totally interchangeable names. You had like natural elements and like natural resources and like resourceful elements and like <laughs> elemental resources. And like he was in one of those groups. I don't know which. Not the one that Jean Grey was in, but a different one. Jean Grey is also killing it. Um, yeah, yeah. She's, she's, you know, I, I, I stick with like, I stick with super lyrical newcomers and veterans who have always been dope, like Gene, like Farrell Monch, yeah. you know, um, yeah. We've been joined by Adam Mann's back, talking about a range of things. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts, and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black, everything.